This is the Italian Citizenship Podcast, hosted by Marco Permunian and Rafael Di Furia. Hello there and welcome to another edition of the Italian Citizenship Podcast, presented by ItalianCitizenshipAssistance.com. Of course, as always, we are back at it with Italian attorney from ItalianCitizenshipAssistance.com, Marco Permunian. How are you doing, man? Good, how are you? I'm doing great, thank you. In today's episode, we wanted to get into a little bit of the nitty gritty and shed light on a part of the process that maybe doesn't get so seen or so thought about so much when applying for Italian citizenship. And we specifically really wanted to focus on Italian citizenship by descent, just because there are so many details of what happens in the background. We've touched on some of these things in the, in the past, but we wanted to do another episode to really just focus specifically on what is going on, because when you make the application, all of a sudden it's kind of, you're just in this waiting limbo, just wondering what's happening, how is it happening, what's going on with my process. And so Marco, I'm sure you're very familiar with your clients contacting you saying, hey, how, what's going on, how's how things looking? <laughs> but maybe just to get started from the very beginning with Italian citizenship by descent, and then we'll get into 1948 cases later. Um, or maybe there's a lot of a lot of um, uh, crossover between the two. But once the person has made their application, what are the next steps from there that they don't see it all in the background? That's a very interesting question. You know, a lot of people they wonder what happens behind the scenes, like what happens after I file my application at the consulate. Why does it take so long? And what do they do with my application? Uh, what what goes on uh, at the consulate? And uh, the, the truth is that the process is the process for citizenship by descent is a relatively easy process that does involve a few steps while the application is being processed. There are some things that go on, but uh, it's mostly a simple process which can be explained relatively easily and i think a lot of people you know um will be happy to understand what what goes on like while the application is being processed because you know that that justifies the wait they they can wait more easily if they know what goes on after the application is presented so maybe let's start from the beginning and and maybe let's take a step back and and explain for a second what you need to uh, put together in order to file your application uh, at the consulate. And uh, we've talked about this many times, and what you need is basically all of the VITA records uh, from the Italian-born ancestor down to you. And um, all the documents will need to be apostilled and legalized and translated. And we made a lot of episodes on the topic, so people who are interested in understanding how to gather documents to support the citizenship application can watch those episodes. But once you have all the documents together and you go to your appointment, what happens? First of all, let me take another step back, you do need to book an appointment at the consulate, and normally it's advisable to do that way ahead of time. And as soon as you decide that you want to pursue Italian citizenship, because we have said that many times, there is a wait time for the appointment. So between the time in which the appointment is booked and the actual date of the appointment, you can gather all the necessary documents. But then you go to the consulate and submit your application, meaning you go there, you you access the building, you have to show your uh, appointment confirmation. In the lobby and you have to go to the window uh, where there's a clerk and you submit your application meaning all the documents translated and legalized all the application forms uh, necessary to apply for citizenship which are published on the website of the consulate and then you hand in the application and then you know it's a very short meeting during which the clerk reviews the documents asks any questions that they may have on the documents, maybe clarifications on who's who, who is your great-grandfather, uh, why is the name a little bit different here, and you give your explanations, and then the clerk will just tell you, okay, now we're going to process your application, and you wait, we're going to let you know. 
And some people leave the consulate and they, they have no idea how long they have to wait, what happens, what they have to do with the application, with all the documents that were collected. And like I said, the process is from a legal and technical standpoint and from a bureaucratic standpoint, a quite simple process, meaning that the clerk will take all your documents and put them in a folder with your name on it. And that folder will probably sit on their table for a while because the clerk has a lot of applications to process which were filed before yours. So you cannot expect the clerk, unfortunately, to work on your application from day one because they have a huge workload, especially the citizenship office. So what will happen is that your application will probably sit on their table for, for a while. Uh, how long that will be, I can't really say, because of course we're talking about internal, uh, an internal process uh, which cannot be seen from outside. But um, it will stay, probably sit there for a while until your turn arrives and the clerk actually uh, takes your application from the pile and you know start review all the documents. And even if normally when you submit the application on the day of your appointment, the clerk goes through the documents and realizes immediately if there is an issue or some documents or discrepancies that they want you to fix and they tell you immediately and they give you the opportunity to fix those documents. But it could happen that when the clerk takes your application from the pile of applications and starts to check your documents, it could happen even if it's not normally the rule, but it could happen that they see something that they don't like and they at some point, some maybe some weeks or months after the application has been presented, you're contacted by the consulate and you're asked to maybe rectify a discrepancy on a document. I want to state it very clearly, these are normally rare instances because if there is a problem with your documents, normally the clerk realizes that and, and tell you about that on the day in which the application is filed. But it's not that it's a law and the clerk has to do that on the day in which the application is filed, the clerk could realize that the documents need some... Um, the clerk could realize that some discrepancies need to be corrected or some documents are missing even after the appointment when they start processing your application. But normally that's not the case. So normally when the clerk starts to work on the application, what they do is they review your case. Once again, they review all the documents, they make sure that everything is there, and then they start to contact all of the consulates that have jurisdiction on the places where the documents that you presented were issued. So say, for example, that you apply for citizenship at the consulate in New York City, but you had documents from California because your grandfather, great-grandfather emigrated first to New York and then went to California. And then you have documents from the state of New Jersey and maybe you were born in Texas, and maybe your father was born in Chicago. So there are several Italian consulates that have jurisdiction on these places, and what the consulate where you applied has to do is they have to check with all the other consulates that have jurisdiction on these places if they have any knowledge of one of your ancestors and ascendants in your Italian line ever renounced their Italian citizenship. So they do so based on where your documents were issued, but also based on a list of residences for yourself and your ascendants and ancestors that you present on the day in which you submit the application. In other words, when you submit the application on the day of your appointment, you have to present a series of forms one for yourself, one for your parent, one for your grandparent, one for your great-grandparent. So from yourself up to the ancestor that you're using. And of course, if you're applying through your parent, because your parent is the one who was born in Italy, there are only two forms, one for yourself and one for your parent. So it's one form for each person in the Italian line, um, in the line of descent, basically. And these forms need to be filled out with a list of places and of residency and years in which the person resided and years during which that person resided in that specific place. So for example, for yourself, you will prepare a list that could say, you know, I've lived from 
uh, when I was born to the age of 18 in the state of New York, and then I moved from the age of 18 to the age of 25 to the state of Massachusetts, and, and, and so on. And the same goes for your father. If you're applying through your father for your grandfather or grandmother, depending on who you're applying through, all the way uh, up to the ancestor. Um, and the consulate will use that list of places and uh, will also check where the documents were issued uh, because if you leave out a place, for example, if you leave out uh, a place in the list of residences for your father, but the consulate says that your father got married in, in that specific state, state, it means that most likely he lived. So they're going to check with all of these consulates to see if they have any notice of you or your ascendants renouncing their Italian citizenship. So that's the activity that takes the most time um, because they have to wait for replies from these consulates, and that could take a while. You know, we're talking about Italian consulates that are overwhelmed right now with applications. So the consulate that processes your application has to wait for the other consulates to get back to, to them because the thing is, if there is somebody in the Italian line who renounced the right to Italian citizenship, then you could no longer qualify for Italian citizenship. And we can talk about that rule in a second. Uh, but that's one of the activities that take time, which would be your consulate checking with all the other consulates uh, to see if there is anyone in your Italian line who renounced their Italian citizenship or their right to Italian citizenship. and they have to do so also with regard to the municipality of birth of your Italian-born ancestor. So not only they have to contact all of the consulates that I just mentioned, but also the municipality of birth of your Italian ancestor, because your Italian ancestor could also have renounced um, their Italian citizenship in the municipality in which they were born. Absolutely fascinating. Truly, truly fascinating. And I know there are a lot of people out there that want to know why and have the big question kind of over their head, why it is that the Italian government wants to know if somebody's ancestor ever renounced. I mean, the likelihood of somebody actually actively going to renounce their citizenship almost never happened for at least the majority of people. But why is it that the Italian government checks on this? Yeah, so basically, uh, first of all, let me clarify, because there can be some confusion around it, that we're not talking about the naturalization. That's a different issue, meaning in order to qualify for citizenship, you have to basically show if and when your ancestor became naturalized in the U.S., your Italian-born ancestor, and you will only qualify for citizenship if your ancestor born in Italy became naturalized after his or her child was born mm -hmm. in America, or if your ancestor never naturalized. That's a different issue. Right now, we're talking about the uh, renunciation to Italian citizenship, which means if your ancestor either never became naturalized or naturalized after the child was born, then citizenship would be passed from the Italian ancestor to the child born in the US. But then What's important to verify is whether there were uh, interruptions in the transfer of citizenship from one generation to the other, meaning that everybody in the Italian line who had the right to Italian citizenship, even if they never formally applied for Italian citizenship, but they had the right to Italian citizenship, and they could have given up this right by renouncing the right or renouncing Italian citizenship, they're two similar concepts. So, and if they did so, there would be trace of that at the consulate abroad. So let me give an example. It's going to be easier to understand. So if your great-grandfather became naturalized in America after your grandfather was born, then your grandfather would have been born with the U.S. citizenship by birth and with Italian citizenship through descent. So the child would have gotten Italian citizenship uh, from the parent at the time of the child's birth. So that child would be somebody with American citizenship, but also with a right to Italian citizenship. 
And that same child could have gone to the consulate and renounced their allegiance to the Italian kingdom or republic. And that would be an interruption of transfer of citizenship from that person to the next person in the Italian line. And of course, a renunciation normally never occurred. So we're talking about probably one case in a million, something that would never happen. Some, the people in your Italian line would have had no reason to uh, renounce their Italian citizenship. But it's something that, legally speaking, needs to be proven. And you do so by self-declaring that none of your ancestors and, and yourself, too, never renounce their Italian citizenship or their right to Italian citizenship and by and the consulate needs to basically verify that by contacting all of the other consulates that have jurisdiction on the places where the ascendants and the ancestor and yourself lived in America, and also by contacting the comune in which your ancestor was born in Italy to make sure that there is no evidence anywhere of anybody in your Italian line, including yourself and your Italian-born ancestor, renouncing their Italian citizenship. Mm, I got that. No, definitely makes sense. So thank you so much for clarifying that point. And then also, just while we're on this line of ancestry, uh, the consulates in the U.S. do often ask for not just the line of relatives going back directly connecting you to Italy, but also the indirect individuals that were married into that family line. There are a lot of people who also wonder, why is it that the Italian consulate asks for their information as well, or at least some Italian consulates? Some Italian consulates do ask for that information and the related documents uh, because they want to check all of the information on the documents and you know, by the record documents for these individuals to make sure that the other individuals, the one in the Italian line, are actually your ancestors and that you're not, mm. so to speak, cheating and providing other documents pertaining to other people that have nothing to do with you. So in other words, and practically speaking, if you're applying through your great-grandfather, some consulates will also want you to present documents for your great-grandmother because her name and date of birth, as stated on her birth record, need to match with the information, for example, that is on the marriage record, which is a key document for the process, as it is the birth certificate of your male ancestor and his death certificate. So by basically cross-referencing the marriage record and the birth record for your great-grandmother in the example that I just gave, they can make sure to some extent that it's really your great-grandmother and your great-grandfather getting married mm -hmm. and that there is no doubt about it. And so is this also to do with the assumption that the, at least under Italian law, that the husband is automatically the father? Yeah, that has to do with that too, meaning by confirming that the couple was married, you also automatically confirm if the marriage happened before the birth of the child that the father is automatically to be considered, legally speaking, the, ch the father of the child without any need to further prove the paternity because under Italian law, a couple that is married and that gives birth to a child within wedlock, uh, in, in that situation, the father is automatically presumed to be the father of the child. Very interesting, and thank you so much for explaining and shedding a bit more light on that topic. But just to get a little bit more back into kind of some of what happens in the background. So far, basically we've spoken about the, the confirmation checks that happen at the consulate, the comune, or actually potentially even multiple consulates. Uh, what are some of the other steps that happen in the background during this process? So what the consulate will do is at times they will also do some research um, to make sure that the information that you are providing is actually correct. So it happened a few times that the consulate got back to the applicant by saying, okay, you presented a bunch of documents that show that you qualify for Italian citizenship, but we did find through research additional information that we would like 
to receive clarification on. Mm -hmm. For example, it's not unusual or it's not um, impossible that the consulate takes the initiative to go online and research on the many databases that are available online information about the Italian ancestor or maybe they're looking for confirmation that it's actually him that it's not a namesake and maybe they look for census records the bottom line is you are required to present a series of documents including um, the ancestor's birth certificate his naturalization records census records and uh, and so on um, but it could be that the consulate has doubts regarding some of the documents that you presented and they take the initiative to do some more research they maybe find another census record online with the name of your ancestor or what they believe to be your ancestor and they ask you okay so you're telling me that he never naturalized why there's a document here that says that he naturalized and maybe it's just a namesake maybe it's nothing but and and it's not at all of the times that happens that the consulate does research but i've seen that happen of course you have nothing to worry about if your documents show that you qualify for citizenship if you're sure that you located the right documents but that's something else that could go on behind the scenes and of course nobody has any way to know how much research they do if they do it all the times if they do it occasionally rarely but i've seen the consulate coming back to the applicant with some research of their own and asking for questions and that was a total surprise you know nobody thought that the consulate went through the trouble of looking on ancestry.com uh, for information about the applicant's great grandfather, but I've seen that happen a few times. So I'd say that wow. that's one of the things that could potentially go on behind the scenes. Fascinating. I, I I wouldn't have even thought about that happening. That's that's going into some pretty serious detail there. But I know that that's part of the the checks that you at ICA do uh, with you and your team uh, during the initial consultation, initial research phase that you do to make sure that everything is in order. Uh, and ready to go for the process. So uh, it sounds like uh, just kind of putting the pieces together that you guys have already taken care of that to make sure that in that rare instance that they're not going to uh, find anything that you already ha don't know yourself. Exactly. And, um, and that was mostly for people who do their own research and you know decide mm -hmm. to go through the process maybe by themselves and um don't expect the consulate to not do their own research um it's it's possible because i've seen that happening with with some people that i've talked to that the consulate comes back to applicants and say okay you 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 told me that and now i'm seeing something that uh brings more questions but of course, for all of ICA's clients, we do all the research in the preliminary assessment and we do all the research that is necessary before our clients sign up for our services. So it's, it's not mm -hmm. something that happens with our clients. That's absolutely fantastic. So it really sounds as though that the, the whole process of processing, for lack of a better way of phrasing it, is really to verify that the information that you've provided is correct. They're not actually going in and trying to like create something it's really just seeing that all of the pieces of the puzzle line up together or is there anything else that actually happens uh, that we've that we've missed out on now that's correct you know because these applications are applications that involve older documents and um when you apply for citizenship by descent, in, in a lot of cases, you're applying through a great grandparent. The consulate, like you just said, they want to make sure that uh, all of the pieces um, of the puzzle are there. Uh, but another thing that they probably check and double check if, is if you reside within their jurisdiction. We've, we've said that many times. There are roughly 10 consulates in the US and each one of them has a jurisdiction and you can only apply for citizenship through that consulate if you reside within the consulate's jurisdiction. And uh, of course, the consulate has no way to access maybe some, some information, some centralized information about you 
all they do is they rely on the information that you provide and documents that you provide to make sure that you reside within their jurisdiction, which is why they ask you to provide normally the driver's license or state ID issued in the state where you reside with your current address and maybe utility bills, bank statements with your address. And as part of the process, they also check that you actually reside within the jurisdiction of the consulate. But that's probably the last thing that they check um, as part of the process. So like we said, they check the documents, they, they do some maybe some research, they check your uh, proof of residency that you submit, and then they just, as soon as they hear, they hear back from all the other consulates that they have to contact in the Italian municipality, they process your application and they issue a letter that they send to you normally either through the mail, which is not really happening lately because they tend to do things uh, through the email. Um, and it's nothing formal. It's nothing. Uh, there's no certificate of citizenship that is mailed out to you. And we have said this many times in our videos. That's because you are applying for a retroactive recognition of a birth right. status. So a right that you already have. So all the consulate does is they tell you, okay, we have verified through all the documents that you presented that you have the right to Italian citizenship, that you have had the right to Italian citizenship since ever since you were born. So we're giving you the recognition of your rights. So they basically have just to send a letter or an email confirming that you became an Italian citizen. And after they've done so, uh, you are formally an Italian citizen. There are a few more steps that happen afterwards, but that's when you become an Italian citizen. Mm. Yeah, no, and it's it's interesting that you do mention that one little tidbit about the certificate, the Italian citizenship certificate. While they don't mail it to you, it uh, what, like because when I was going through the process, I was thinking, okay, I want every document that proves I've put so much time and effort into this. I want to make sure I've got the passport, I've got the this, I've got the that, and if there's a citizenship certificate available, I want that just so that I have that extra piece of paper in case there's ever any question. And I asked about it at the consulate. And the woman said, why do you want the, the certificate? I was like, well, to prove that I'm an Italian citizen. She's like, a certificate of citizenship doesn't prove that you're an Italian citizen. <laughs> I was a bit surprised about that, that it doesn't necessarily prove that you are the citizen. Just potentially somebody with your name basically is a citizen, but it doesn't prove you yourself are the citizen <laughs> but it sounds as though from everything that you've described so far we've really run through the end of the process or is there anything else that happens when a person becomes an italian citizen so that's the moment when you're recognized retroactively as an italian citizen since birth but there are other things that happen after your recognition behind the scenes so that you don't really see but that do happen mm -hmm. after you have obtained your uh, recognition of Italian citizenship which would be your birth certificate is sent to the municipality in which your ancestor was born they don't physically send the certificate anymore it's sent through PEC which is basically stands for certified email it's a way of communicating between public offices which exists only um, in Italy and not in America so the Italian consulate which is part of Italy will send your birth certificate to the comune where your ancestor was born to be registered there and that's because your birth certificate needs to be registered somewhere so if you never resided in Italy before the place in which it will be registered can only be the place of birth of your Italian ancestor uh, your birth certificate will probably stay on file at the consulate but its digital version uh, of course legalized and translated will be sent to the municipality which will register it in the registries so you will find yourself in the registry of the people that were born in that municipality in that specific year even if you were not born there so that's basically the very conclusion of the uh, dual citizenship process at the same time the consulate will also send your marriage record if you were married and divorce records if you were divorced or if you have multiple marriages they will send all of those to the italian comune to be registered 
and at the same time they will register you with the IDE, which happens automatically. The IDE is the registry of Italians, the Italian citizens residing abroad. And if you applied for citizenship through a consulate, uh, you will be registered in the in this special registry, which basically lists all of the Italian citizens that reside abroad. And this registry basically is held both by the consulate in the jurisdiction where you reside and by the Italian municipality where your, where your birth certificate is registered. So both the municipality and the consulate will have a record of you residing abroad with your address and uh, if they will know if you're married, divorced. And that's the very conclusion of the process. After this, you can only apply for an Italian passport. There's nothing else you have to do or think about. And I think it's one curiosity that people have is, do I automatically get a copy of my Italian birth certificate? The answer is no. Mm -hmm. If you want a copy of your Italian birth certificate, you have to go get it from the municipality in which it was recorded, but you don't really need it. The You can always get it. There is no deadline. If you needed it after 10 years, you can go get it after 10 years. It will stay recorded in the, in the registries and it will always be there accessible. Uh, but the document that normally confirms that you are an Italian is your Italian passport, which at the end of the day is a travel document. So it's not that if you don't have a passport, you're not a citizen, but that's normally the easiest way to prove that you are a citizen. Um, especially when you're traveling internationally. Well, that's awesome. Uh, thank you so much for going into detail about this process and to really shed light on what goes on in the background because I know there's so many people, like I said in the beginning of the episode, that are so curious what's going on, what's happening, what's this, what's that. And so even if you're not hearing anything, there's always something going on. Maybe there's some waiting periods in between but things are always in process. So that's the good news. But of course, Marco, before we end off this episode, how can people get in contact with you and your team? People can contact us through our website, italiancitizenshipassistance.com. Uh, people can also give us a call. Our phone number is on our website. Absolutely fantastic. And of course, if you're interested in more content like this about Italian dual citizenship, be sure that you are subscribed to the YouTube channel as well as the audio only podcast. But of course, the bonus by being subscribed to the YouTube channel is that you're also automatically subscribed to the Italian real estate podcast, where we talk about a little bit more of some of the practical aspects, not just the legal aspects of moving to Italy and renting in Italy, buying property in Italy. We've also done a series on different areas in Italy that Marco and I both enjoy. Uh, so make sure that you're subscribed for all of that. Also, if you're interested in any content about life abroad, living abroad as a dual citizen expat, be sure to come over to my YouTube channel, youtube.com slash Rafael Di Furia, or you can find me online, Rafael Di Furia, or you can search on the audio podcasting platforms for not your average globetrotter. And thank you again so much, Marco, for making yourself available for this episode of the Italian Citizenship Podcast presented by Italian Citizenship Assistance. Dot com. Stay safe and healthy out there, and we will see you all next time. Later. Thank you. <laughs>